Today I'll take you to the Arctic trying to shoot the northern lights from a moving ship. Also, Wilson wants to move his photos to a different disc and Tom is trying to take pictures of his black dog. This is Tips from the Top Floor 857 for Thursday, March the 7th, 2019. Hey, hello and welcome. This is Chris Marquardt. You're listening to Tips from the Top Floor, coming to you from the Viewfinder Villa again. I'm back from Norway and... Yeah, I spent the last week mostly trying to get over a bit of a cold that I brought from the Arctic. But hey, it's it's like a little like a little souvenir. So let's see. Oh yeah, there's there's one news item that I found out about while in the Arctic, while on the ship, which yeah made my day. Um, the wide angle book is going to be released in. Taiwan. It's been translated to Chinese. I kind of heard about that, but didn't really know. And now it's a a done deal. I think it should be out pretty soon. So if you are, <laughs> if you speak Chinese, if you want a Chinese version of it, um, yeah, it'll be released pretty soon. I, I think this month in in Taiwan. So yay for that. Um, also, good good book news on another front from the uh, film photography handbook. I have told you that we have come up with a second edition here in the in, in the German version, which includes a lot of new information and just uh, yeah, just just a few bits and things that didn't make it into the first one, and it's been over, uh, it's been worked through in some other respects, and that is now also going to come to the English market. So there is a it's currently in translation. And we're uh, working with the translator to identify the pieces that are changed and uh, help them get this, get everything right. So that is in the works, and I'm really, really happy about this. And this uh, will be I, no date, no date for that yet. But I asked the publisher, "Can I talk about this?" And they said, "Sure, go ahead." So um, yeah, probably sometime in summer, mid late summer. But that, again, don't. Don't quote me on that, uh, but that's what I heard. So if you are looking forward to a second edition, an updated version of the film photography, it's in, isn't that interesting? Don't we live in amazing times where film photography is moving so fast that it is, in fact, uh, almost necessary after... Well, it came out in 2015 in German, so uh, after four years, it's necessary to, uh, to update it. To include new information, who would have thought that uh, that film photography is that alive and kicking? Anyway, so those are the book news. Um, I've also updated the video. I re I recently released that. I think I briefly talked about it here about uh, Tom, the guy we met in New Zealand, the ninety-year-old farmer who not only uh, builds airplanes, but he still flies them regularly, and he's just working on uh, his uh, his next airplane with 90. And uh, I, I shot a little video there, and I've just updated it to include a bit more information. So that will also be linked in the show notes. Now, what do I want to talk about? Well, I just returned from two weeks in the Arctic, and <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much back here for at least a couple of months so um that's good <laughs> it's it's good especially after you spent pretty much the first two months of the year uh abroad but anyway so um the arctic shooting in the arctic photography in the arctic and i just want to briefly talk about a few things um especially about the one thing that this time blew me away and that was the northern lights the aurora so you have a few challenges, right? Um, you it, the Arctic means cold weather, usually it does, um, and weather-wise, from from a precipitation point of view, both of those two weeks were quite different. It was two weeks. It was one week and one week. It was two two times a similar tour, and uh, of course, one of the things there are many things why people come on these tours. First of all, it's just it's just an amazing time on a ship 
with like 12 guests on a ship and uh, and a expedition guide and a photographer and the crew and you you spend time together you work through issues together like photography issues of course you uh, you have time for lectures so we had lectures every day we had lectures um you move from place to place and you you, you get to see a lot of different things and and then in the Arctic, of course, it's the Arctic, so you have just a different climate, you have different different uh, flora, you have different wildlife, you have very different landscapes. I mean, the, the Arctic landscapes up there. Yeah, I'm a great fan of that. And of course, you if you're, if you're a bit lucky, you also get the aurora. And uh, photographing the aurora is, well, it's... It, it comes with its challenges, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, first of all, what is the aurora? The aurora is caused by charged particles from the sun. So it's the solar wind interacting with uh, particles in our Earth's atmosphere. And uh, believe it or not, the aurora happens all around the clock, 24-7. But the strength of the aurora depends on on uh, things like the solar wind uh, and its, its density and its speed. And of course, it depends on the time of day because during the daytime, you can't see it. Um, also depends on our magnetosphere, the magnetic field of the Earth, and which, which protects us, which is there to protect us from the solar wind um, by de de like deflecting most of it, I think. Helps our atmosphere not to be ripped off and this is good this is the, the, the our magnetosphere is what keeps us alive because it helps the atmosphere stay in place and uh probably i guess also kind of saves us from from a lot of the radiation um but if all those three factors align like the solar wind if it's strong if it's dense if the uh, if it's fast <laughs> if the earth's magnetic field is just the right way i think it has to be low for that only then do you kind of get to see the aurora and uh there are apps that kind of help you to do a forecast there's a what's called the kp index which i think indicates the magnetic change in the magnetic field uh, and then there are three more factors that that you that that you kind of have to of course uh, get right or that have to be right for you to be able to see and photograph the aurora and that is first of all the weather like obviously the sky should be clear or at least there should be holes in the clouds otherwise uh, the clouds um, will cover up the aurora we had a couple of times where we had sort of an aurora but it was sky was covered in a cloud layer so you had like greenish clouds which wasn't too bad but it's not, not as spectacular as like the actual aurora. That's a factor one. The second factor is the light, of course. Uh, in, the, in the Arctic, uh, the sun won't set for parts of the year. So if you're there in summer, good luck. You won't see the aurora. And, um, and then there are times where the sun won't rise for parts of the year, but, which means you will probably see it a lot. And then there's this time in between, um, which is one of... The times we chose, uh, mid mid to end of February. Um, and that also had to do with the temperatures. Because if, if you're too deep in winter, in the Arctic, the temperatures can be so low that it'll be hard to kind of stand outside at night. It will be not comfortable. Um, so if you want to take pictures of the aurora, you'll be more freezing than anything else. So uh, so that's that's what where we have influence on the aurora right the the time of year and uh, february again is great because the the days aren't too long the the sun rises at 8 a.m or was when we were there and i think it set sometime around 5 p.m and the, then the temperatures aren't too low so you won't freeze your butt off <laughs> i think the temperatures were were in the in the range of uh between minus five and plus five Celsius, which is right around freezing point. And uh, yeah, that's that's helpful. So that's uh, that's the first thing, the temperatures, and again, by, cho by choice of when you go. Um, and February is in the middle of that. It's, it's in the, at the end of the winter storms. 
and it's when it starts to be more springy. And then second, the second area of influence that we had was our location. And that's where being, <laughs> being on a ship it comes in really handy for, well, for two reasons. First, the ship ships usually have a pretty good weather forecast because they need that um, for, well, I'd say at least for the next 12 to like 24 hours. Um, so we would know where those, where the sky would be open. And uh, the second reason is a ship is like a mobile home. I mean, you can just move the whole thing to a location where you have a better chance to photograph the aurora. And that's what we did. And in the end, we we were lucky enough to manage to align all of those factors. And we got an aurora on both in both of those weeks for both of those groups, which made me really happy. And <clears throat> the aurora during the first week was, was decent, albeit a bit faint. And uh, we were in a harbor with an open sky, but, <laughs> but uh, there was also, um, well, a lot of artificial light so we had to kind of fight that but i still got a, a few decent shots there um but then what really took the crown was the last two nights of the second week and yeah those were memorable so we, we sailed down south uh, in the beginning of the week that's what we did with both tours and then kind of made our way back north um over time and we uh we sailed through the night in that last night at sea and then it happened and we got like a fireworks display unlike any that i've seen before that was just mind-boggling and now the problem of course is we're on a moving ship and we also can't just stop the ship where we are and even if we did we, we couldn't anchor we could we couldn't go to a pier um and even then the ship would be moving it's a moving inherently moving platform so there we are bringing out the tripods, putting on warm jackets and hats and gloves to, to shoot this firework from, from a moving ship. And yeah, that, that, that does pose its own challenges. Uh, just a few things about shooting the Northern Lights, okay? Uh, first of all, they are always different. I've seen them several times but they were never the same in brightness or in intensity um, or in motion so I've, I've had people ask me when I posted photos online that uh, what what settings I shot them at and I'm happy to provide those but they, they don't mean anything because every aurora is different and you will need different settings for any aurora if it's a fast one you want shorter shutter speeds if it's a bright one you can reduce your ISO. If it's a very slow one, you might get away with longer shutter speeds and lower ISO and get less noise and so on. So the, the values do not really mean anything. Um, yeah, they come at different speeds, but you, you kind of want to keep your shutter speed short. Um, they, they come in with in different forms. They might Some have soft edges, sometimes they have hard edges. Um, they come at different sizes. So you are looking at shooting wide angle. And often it's kind of an established thing. Full frame, fourteen millimeters. It's kind of a um, yeah, a, a, a focal length that a lot of photographers use that shoot auroras. Um, I use my twenty-four millimeters because I have to admit I forgot my fourteen millimeter at home. You might remember I was only back home for like a couple to three days between New Zealand and the Norway trip. And for some reason, I didn't pack the 14. So I had to use my 24 millimeter, which was kind of a bit of a bummer initially, I thought, because you want the brightest possible lens as well. Um, and the, the 14 millimeter I have goes to f2.8. Uh, the 24 only goes to f3.5. So I lost a bit of brightness there and a bit of angle of view, but it turned out really well um, despite that. And you also will shoot at high ISOs. I I would personally rather do more noise reduction in post production uh, in post processing than yeah shoot at lower ISOs and longer. Um, I'd rather have them have the auroras a bit more crisp and at shorter shutter speeds. So high ISOs, um, 
the values I shot, and again, they don't really mean anything, but for this specific situation, I shot at uh, one second at f3.5 um, at an ISO of 6400, which most modern cameras can handle. You will have noise in your photos, but uh, there's a, an entire... Well, I'll talk about post-processing in a minute. And then you're on a moving platform on a ship, and you shoot something that's moving. So... It turns out it works best if you still kind of have the camera on a tripod and, again, get in as short shutter speed as possible. And uh, the best way to do that and to, to, to increase your chances to get something that works is to shoot with a wide open aperture and to shoot lots. And, uh, of course, there are, there are a few tricks if you are on a moving platform like a ship. Uh, the motion of the ship is uh, it comes in cycles, right? It goes up and down and sideways, so it might be rolling a bit. Uh, so you can try to time the shots to that motion. Or you do what I did and just like shoot as much as you can and take the time to sift through them later. Um, so yeah, I shot a, a lot in it. Uh, I think in, in the end I shot about 400 photos within half an hour. And I ended up with maybe about 10 photos that I love and that I want to share. So, uh, yeah, that's about the ratio that I personally manage. But I still try to shoot uh, at the at the at the point the ship is at the at the at the crest of the of the wave. And then I think I shot all the time. Now, in addition, another complication is the focusing. Uh, especially if you don't have any far away features that you could use to like focus on, such as the moon or uh, a house or, or, or a house or street lights at the horizon. Um, it, yeah, the autofocus on an aurora does not really work. So that uh, yeah, it's just yeah, it's too faint. Um, some cameras might get away with might be able to focus on autofocus on a star but that even that doesn't didn't work for me so uh, what i did is i manually focused on i used live view to manually focus on a, a star and that kind of works i mean you, you go in live view you might have to crank up the iso or your camera does it for you and you um you zoom in digitally in in the live view and then you manual focus and then you just take your hands off and uh, I did that and it worked quite well um, and uh, yeah that's how I got my 400 photos with <laughs> with 390 to throw away um, a word about post-production the usual suspects of course you will adjust like exposure and the black point and white balance adjustments uh, I shot those at um, a fixed uh, white balance at 3600 Kelvin, which was close enough, um, but I still adjusted them slightly to to uh, the green of the aurora. It's, they are majorly green, at least those that we saw. And that green tone, uh, something that, yeah, you, you gotta get it in the ballpark and then you just adjust that in, in post-production to what, what feels right. I mean, they are all different anyway, so I think a bit of artistic license is just fine there. And and then in post-production, one of the few areas, uh, uh, auroras are one of the few areas where I will use uh, clarity. I kind of try to avoid it for, like, you know, it tends to create a bit of an over-processed look. So, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of clarity at all. But in, in, a, in an aurora, especially if you use it if you use it just on on the aurora itself, like brush it in, that does wonders. It works really well. Like I I would use an a graduated filter on the sky and then dial in the clarity a bit. Um, now the, back to the motion thing uh, again. With with if you shoot from a ship with a tripod and you have like a, an exposure that's longer than just a few fractions of a second. In this case, one second. Uh, you will get stars, and they are squiggly lines, at least in those phases when the ship moves. Unless you hit one of those spots at the top of a wave where the ship is kind of 
standing still for a second. Um, and there were a couple of shots where I liked the aurora a lot. I loved how it looked. Uh, the composition was spot on, but it was it got squiggly stars in them because it was yeah just not shot at the right point in time for the stars. And with a couple of those shots, I actually spent the time um, to take them out. That's like a 30-minute clone session. It zoomed in with the clone tool to clone out every single star. And I I like what how that turned out. Again, there's artistic license, but the alternative with the squiggly star lines, and of course, they all squiggle the same way, so it looks really weird. Um, that did, that didn't work for me, so... Yeah, that's uh, what I did. I spent on two of those shots, I spent 30 minutes to clone all the stars out. <laughs> um, and last but not least, there's one nice feature. When you shoot from a, sh fr from a ship on the sea, and which I like on those shots, and that is you get reflections in the water. And that just, I don't know what it is. I just love to have a water surface in the front of an aurora because it kind of doubles it or it... Uh, I don't know what it does, but it works really well for me. Um, so, yeah, you check out the photos. There are there a few of the aurora shots and a lot more other shots from the last two weeks in northern Norway at tfttf.com slash arctic2019. Again, that's tfttf.com slash arctic2019. And the uh, link is, of course, also in the show notes. And um, yeah, it was a good time. I really liked um, the, the photography. Of course, the people. Um, just a quick shout out. First week, first week of the two weeks um, with Bruce, Abby, Skip, Eric, Ulrike, Wolfgang, Pam, Nora, Ingo, Andreas, Charlotte and Christine. And on the second week, Thomas, Simon, Helmut, Christine, Ulla, Michael, Manu, Matze, Martina, Alex, Nico and Andreas. So thanks everyone for for joining us on that tour. This is not the last time I'll do that because I kind of really like that mode of travel and that, uh, yeah, the, the opportunities that you get that you do not get any other way. Oh, and of course, there's one other person who was with us, well, there were a whole bunch of people with us on the ship. There was a captain and the first mate and two technicians and a service person and a cook, a, an amazing cook. And uh, I'm probably missing several, so my apologies. Um, but yeah, there was one other person um, apart from the guests and myself on the ship, and that is kind of an important person, uh, Henry, Henry Paul Wolf. Is, was our exp expedition guide on those two tours. Um, he's a German. He lives in Iceland. And he uh, he knows a lot about uh, volcanoes, about glaciers, about ice, about uh, yeah, the, the whole Arctic region. He, is, um, he guides expeditions at different places in Greenland and in Svalbard and, yeah, up, up in northern Norway. So uh, he and I, we got along really well. And I think that also helped make this a great experience for everyone. And uh, we got along so well that I invited him to be a guest host on Curiously Polar, on the uh, podcast that I started together with Mario Aquarone, another expedition guide from another tour. And uh, yeah, Henry was um, happy to come on the show. And I guess we'll probably have more episodes in the future because there are still a plenty of topics that we can talk about on Curiously Polar. Um, there's episode 44 out right now with Henry on uh, sea ice. And yeah, there are new episodes on the horizon. I will link that specific episode in the show notes. So yes, the Arctic. I love it. <laughs> 
Let me spend a minute and welcome a new sponsor on the show, Shaper. This episode of Tips from a Top Floor is brought to you by Shaper. Take networking from awkward to awesome with Shaper, the number one professional networking platform that uses your experience, interests and goals to help you make the right connections. Whether you're looking for investors, a co-founder, a new job opportunity or just inspiring conversations, Shaper can connect you to professionals who truly want to share tips and help. Each day it suggests 15 people with similar goals and interests for you to meet. Then all you have to do is take a few minutes to swipe through your daily profiles and set up coffees with the people who stand out. If you're a professional, the Shaper app should be installed on your phone. So download the app today or check out Shaper online at shaper.com. Co. That's Shaper, S-H-A-P-R dot C-O. To learn more about Shaper, download the app and improve the way you network. This episode is also brought to you by HoneyBook. Do you own a small business? Are you frustrated by dealing with back and forth emails, endless paperwork and getting paid? HoneyBook.com can help you spend less time handling the administration work and more time doing what you love. HoneyBook is an all-in-one business management platform for creative small businesses. HoneyBook makes it easy to streamline your process with client and calendar management tools and custom branded brochures, proposals and contracts. You can even get e-signatures, generate invoices and get paid faster, all with one online system. Over 75,000 photographers, designers, event professionals and other solo entrepreneurs have saved hundreds if not thousands of hours a year with HoneyBook. And that's why this show has partnered with HoneyBook.com to offer tips from the top floor listeners 50% off the first year of HoneyBook with promo code TOPFLOOR. So get started at HoneyBook.com today and use promo code TOPFLOOR for 50% off your first year. Again, that's HoneyBook.com, promo code TOPFLOOR. All right, now let's get to some of your questions. Hi, Chris. This is Wilson from Rochester, New York. I have always imported my RAW files using Lightroom on my MacBook Pro, and now I have over 500 gigabytes of disk space taken up by my RAW files. How do I move those files to an external hard drive and tell Lightroom where the new location is? I've tried it before with fewer files, but then, of course, Lightroom can't find the files. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Wilson, for that question. Yeah, Lightroom is uh, can be a bit, well, not quite finicky, I wouldn't say that, but um, you kind of have to know what Lightroom does and how it handles its its files to get that right. Um, you can move files outside of Lightroom in, in the file system in Finder or Explorer, and uh, then Lightroom will bring up a... Yeah, a little question mark next to a grayed out folder in your settings. And that is, of course, a bit of a problem because then it won't have access to the originals and all you have is is the previews and you cannot do that much with just the previews. Um, but you can tell Lightroom where your pictures are if you move them outside of Lightroom by just right clicking on the top level folder that you moved and then tell it, let me see, da, 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 da. Yeah, there it is. Um, update folder location. That's the thing you're looking for. So right click. Well, first of all, in Lightroom, again, go to the left hand sidebar, open that one up, go to the folders section, and then where it uh, shows you the question mark, that top level folder, find that same one in its new location, right click and tell it to update the photo location. That is kind of, uh, that's the way I usually do not do because Lightroom itself can move the files for you. And when you let Lightroom do that, you will also um, make sure that Lightroom keeps track of where the files are now. So Lightroom will move them and update its database. So um, all the locations of the files are in the database and you won't have any disruption doing that. And that's simple, simple as simple as going to that same sidebar to the folders location, uh, the folders tab, open that one. And then you can drag and drop the folders around. And if you do not have the external hard drive that you want to use, um, at the same level where it says folders, there's a plus sign and you can add a folder in that. You can add a new folder to the library. So you will, um, you can use that to add a, let's say, a folder named pictures on your external hard drive. That's what I call mine. It's just pictures and then, under that is the rest of the structure. 
and then uh, you add that and then you can then then it shows up under the folders tab and then you can drag and drop your folders there and it will move the raw files the original files to that new location and in Lightroom everything will stay exactly the same but now the files are on the external hard drive and uh, that also means you should then of course have the external hard drive plugged in if you want to work on your photos or you can use smart previews you can render smart previews for those external files and then you can work on them while the external hard drive is not even there so that is quite smart and last but not least of course no matter where you, your photos are make sure that they are part of your backup just in case an external hard drive fails hello chris it's tom stewart from ontario canada and in a recent podcast you were asking for questions to provide content for the show one of the examples you gave was a perfect fit for a question i didn't even know i had how to photograph my black dog he is always the darkest element of a picture, and it is difficult to get any detail on his fur coat. I'm looking forward to your thoughts, and thanks for the podcast. Hey, Tom. Thank you. Uh, shooting a black dog is, yeah, it's not easy. We have the same thing here with our black cat. It's kind of hard to photograph. And yes, it often shows up black and really black, and I don't see any detail in the fur. Now, it kind of depends a bit on the, the kind of photos you want, of course. Are you, are you looking for like casual snapshots with your smartphone? Or is this more like a, let's say, a portrait session where you want like a really good shot of your dog? But in both cases, um, you'll have to first, uh, first experiment with exposure. Um, if you shoot with a DSLR or with a mirrorless camera, uh, you want to check the manual of your camera to find out how to, to, to dial in exposure compensation. Exposure compensation is the magic word. And then you use that to raise the exposure a bit. If you do this with a smartphone, um, what you want to do is tap on the black dog on the screen to set the, the exposure while you take the shot. Um, that might raise the exposure a bit to bring out the fur a bit nicer. If that's not enough, you can, you can tap the dog and then look for a small sun symbol next to where you tap. That's where you can change the exposure on your smartphone by sliding this little sun up or down. Um, if it's more of a like a, a, a photo session, for portrait session of sorts, try to do the same with the um, adjustment of the exposure. But I would also uh, try to get a, a separate light source above and behind your dog because this way your dog will get have that reflect of its fur and it's what's called a hair light it works with humans works with, with animals works with everyone um, but it will nicely kind of separate the dog from the background which works really well with our black cat and makes it look really nice and that is definitely worth a try And that was it for this episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Thanks again to our two sponsors, Honeybook and Shaper, for the support. If you like this episode or any of the other ones, make sure you tell your friends about it. That's the best way, word of mouth, the by far best way to help keep Tips from the Top Floor in the mind of people. You can, of course, also support me directly and buy me a coffee. Go to tfttf.com slash coffee to find out more. That's tfttf.com slash coffee. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, sound partner Hans Peter Kagrud, publishing and Slack challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Refsitar Armstead, Slack imitations by Chief Imitations Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. And, of course, I'll put the link to the tfttf Slack in the show notes so you can go and discuss photography with other listeners. My name is Chris Marquardt. You'll find me on social media, including still Mastodon at Chris M A R Q U A R D T. Now go out and take amazing photos. Share them with the world. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting. <laughs>